So the seven components for speed and distance, obviously speed's a massive area of the modern game. You know, look at the very elite area and how it's dripping down into the amateur game and we're all trying to hit the ball further. So what are the areas and the components we need to really start to pay attention to? So the first one is going to be your equipment. Is it fitted to you? The second one is simply going to be the impact factor. So that's going to be how you're delivering that club through Trackman or any ball flight data. Third's going to be technique. That's where everyone goes first in my opinion. Then you've got the drills that can help you incorporate movement patterns. Then you've got going to the gym, if you so inclined to want to do that for your golf game. Then you've got the practice environment that you're going to create. And then lastly, then you've got overspeed training, so you know, the stack system, the sw swing speed sticks, all those combined together are all elements of getting speed. So we're going to touch on a lot of those now and see how you can actually start to look at these for the low hanging fruit of actually getting speed into your game. So when we look at it, the factors for equipment, you know, you're going to have weight of shaft. So obviously commonly spoke about lighter shafts gives you more speed, but are you somebody who gets more speed out of a heavier shaft or can actually swing a heavier shaft exactly the same speed so therefore you're swinging a heavier object at the same speed it's going to give you more ball speed extra weight in the club head or are you playing the wrong golf ball i don't spin the ball that much so i play a pro v1x but if you like my dad who actually always says son i want to play that pro v1 well actually that pro v1 is the most lowest spinning golf ball out of that range that we can all get hold of from the shops but we might think that that's the one i need to play because commonly obviously the pro v1x used to be the low spin ball but it's switched around because that's what titleist did so is this something that you really need to be aware of so number one thing is go and get yourself fitted because once you've got yourself fitted you then can tick that box off it make sure that you're having a look at the weight in the club head because for me Titleist put two grams extra in the head, which allowed me to get maximum ball speed out of the club head speed that I've currently, currently able to generate. So that for me is where your low hanging fruit is going to start off. Get this equipment checked out, make sure it's the right stuff for you. Length of shaft, which is obviously then going to lead into impact location. Are you able to hit it out of the middle? And therefore where this weight sits relative to what your miss is going to be. So I live in the neck a little bit, so the weight lives a little bit in the neck here, which therefore means that's going to help me migrate a little bit more towards the middle, but therefore I can then max out my ball speed where I tend to strike the ball in the face. So before we actually get into looking at you increasing your club head speed and trying to hit it further in that regard, the first thing that we really need to be looking at is the loft on that you're able to deliver or are you actually being efficient in the speed you've got this is your low hanging fruit so what is the ball speed you're able to generate so basically what is your smash factor so are you delivering efficient loft and are you hitting with the correct angle of attack so is it more down or is it more up these are going to be huge areas to be looking at and also going back to the fitting element are you able to hit it in the middle of the face or have the weights built into the head in the correct area for you to get the most ball speed out of your impact location. So it's all about is what your impact location is. So when we look at the loft here that's going to be delivered, okay, and then we look at the angle of attack. So we're going to go, if you had a wedge here, you could see that this is a spin loft. This is the difference between the dynamic loft and the angle of attack. And we see that's really big. So when you get a bigger spin loft, this will really make it difficult to put a lot of curvature on the ball. As we increase attack angle and loft comes down, we see how much narrower this angle comes. So when this vector gets very, very narrow in here, this is what's going to put a lot of curvature on the ball potentially, but might make you hit it a long, long way. So it's making sure that the spin rates you're getting matched into the launch angle are the right ones for you. So therefore, this needs to be go in your coaching sessions, looking at what are the correct numbers for you in terms of efficiency, in terms of path, everything else, and then having the technology being fitted and the club being fitted to your information. So for me, a more spinny golf ball, for you it might be a much lower spinning ball. This is where the fitting process is going to come in for you. 
Now, the bit where we all end up going to first is the technical elements, but what we really need to consider are there's four key parts to this. So you've got people who get a really long hand path length golf swing. So someone like a Phil Mickelson and Bubba Watson, they've got an exceptionally long hand path. So because of that, the distance the club head is traveling means that they can get more speed. Then if you go back to when John Daly used to play as a player, you'd see he had a lot of wrist angle at the top in here. What this did is this was an area of him creating more leverage. So again, this was his area for club head speed. Then what we then look at is going into modern times, John Rahm, who absolutely smokes it, but he's got a short golf swing. So he puts a lot of force along the hand pass. So he's able to, in his change of direction, put a lot of force through the club in a really, really short period of time. And then lastly, you've got Matt Fitzpatrick, who is what's called force along the handle, rotationally, pulling it through the golf ball. So these are the areas that we tend to look at. Now, we look at, first of all, some real quick wins for us, okay? So, getting the stance a bit wider is going to help a lot. So, if we normal width the stance is here, making that stance wider is going to be massive for us. If you look at someone like JT, when he's really going out, it's very, very noticeable. He gets a very wide stance here. Okay, what, why? It's easier to get a bit of shift across, okay? Even if you're a centered rotational player, or you're even a bit left-sided at the top, maximum weight shift is when golf shaft is parallel to the ground here. If you get a little bit wider here, you've got to put a bit more force across yourself to get that weight shift in. So this is a big bit, because what it ends up doing is it allows you to create a little bit more torque left and right. The next bit then is the speed of that backswing, okay? You look at Fitzpatrick, he's exceptionally quick in that backswing. This is a big thing. Now, why is the speed of the backswing so important? If I take it back quicker, as I go to change direction at the top, I have to put more force down the handle to slow the club head down to change direction, which means I'm putting more force through the grip in the transition. This is a real big thing for speed. Now, this is an area where you get it, get it out of control, but speed it up a little bit. See whether your contact is affected, okay? Now, what I always think of is when you're making the changes, the first thing is, can you up the speed and then can you get the efficiency to catch back up to it? But if the efficiency never catches up, then you're putting in the wrong components. So that speed's gonna be a big bit because it's obviously what's gonna help you in that change in direction. The next one that we tend to look at is how we can get this little unweighting phase. So the unweighting phase is at the top of the backswing when you're already shifting towards the target laterally here, but you're your, your lightest relative to the ground. So you're shifting along it, but you're not pushing down into it. So when we've got this area where you're at your lightest, what you'd see here is that a lot of the players will have their left heel slightly in the air. If they're not in the air, it's definitely at its lightest relative to heel to toe, up and down the foot there. They're definitely their lightest here. They're either up or they're down, but don't mistake in this for swaying because I cannot move my head at all and let my heel come upwards. It's just allowed me to get a better and waiting phase. This really is good for every single type of player of all four types. So this is definitely one for all of you to explore because it's a big, big one for you. Now, the next one then is gonna be, if you are somebody who fits into that John Daly camp and also the sort of Bubba camp are getting quite long, just simply let those arms come up a little bit. A little bit higher with the hands at the top and let those wrists fully load. So in essence, just complete that backswing. Now, I don't do that, okay? So for me, whenever people who've seen my swing that's pretty short, Dan, you need to complete it. I hit it categorically miles worse because my timing just goes so far off because I have a load a downswing like this, a little bit like a John Rahm, obviously nowhere near as good. So what is it that that player needs, which is me. So this is then, you're gonna to need to be able to have a very strong change in direction, the lateral, but also where this diaphragm moves relative to the target. So it rotates back to the target, 
and it therefore sees as the rib cage re rotate, the lead arm, the left arm against the rib cage tightens. So it's called adducting. So it's basically going against it. So as that adducts against the rib cage, as the rib cage rotates, this then puts more force through the handle and then you can really rotate on it. Something you see with John Rahm, the club's still setting as he's coming down crudely in the past called lag. But this is where a lot of that lag is generated in this direction here. So that left arm is held up there as that shift has moved towards the targets. So the shift is happening this way into the front of the lead foot. Now that's a big bit for all of you that no matter what happens, you're shifting into the front of the left foot which means that therefore you can start to use some vertical force. So even if you don't adduct the lead arm as much, that's something that's gonna be huge. Now, one more bit to really look at from that ground force element is the force down the handle. So if you get to the uh, top of the backswing here and you pull on the handle down towards the golf ball, almost the analogy of ripping the grip off the club towards the ball in this direction. So I'm pulling down on it hard here and ripping it. So this is then, at the same time as me do with me ripping on that, it's going to pull me into the front of the left foot, which is help going to increase that vertical force element. It's going to help me jump back out the way. Now, if I then want to take advantage of that, if I'm somebody who really feels it through the handle, okay, I'm going to try and pull the handle back up and left, which is going to move me from in the front of the left foot here into the heel of the left foot. It's going to increase the vertical force and it's going to get me more open. This is exactly what Fitzpatrick does. Okay, You might not be somebody who feels it through the handle, so to take the same advantage of it, if you feel the push through the front of the left foot just by the foot itself, effectively what you're going to do is feel that you hit your left leg jump backwards, your hip goes upwards, left leg straightens and you're almost jumping out the way. So you'll see people like JT, and Will Zalatoris, their foot will jump out the way like this as they're jumping through the shot and they're using their legs to propel them. So the options are there where you can use the ground, but don't forget it's ground reaction force, okay, not dominant force. So is it that where you've put the force down the handle to give you the ground? Is it the diaphragm movement to help you create more rotation? Or is it the ground itself you use in the feet? These are the elements that you need to explore for you, okay? A couple of bits there, real simple ones in that backswing, but on that way down where it's all at, all the guys are doing it in different ways. Some, like a Bubba Watson, he'll be jumping out of the ground, but he's using it very much through hand speed, okay? So again, and a bit more like a Phil Mickelson, he's got length of hand path, and then letting that hand speed come through bit more of an old school throwaway type of way of doing it if you like but they're all generating exceptional speeds it still have great longevity in the game okay because they're moving in a very very sort of they're moving in a very safe way for their body so it's we look at Bryson when he went down the real big speed route we can't say that's safe with the broken hand, etc. But we can now say that these other guys have got longevity in their own movement patterns. So a real simple drill here that's going to help you become more efficient. So I'll just tie the towel simply to the head of my three iron. Now, all I'm going to do is just have the towel on the floor here. And the first thing I'm going to do is there's going to be resistance from this towel. So I'm going to really try and move quite quickly. So the resistance is going to help increase my strength and speed during that very first move. So as I'm going, you'll see that the, the uh, handle will go first and the club head will lag. So as we go back, it's just going to be... So I can really start to feel like that is catching up. Now, what I'm going to use this for then is, as I get to the top, when I get to about three quarters way back, I'm going to really start to shift left. And really start to feel that pressure going to the front of the left foot and use the lagging of the towel to give me the initiation of when I need to begin that move towards the target. So you can see that really flinging it about. If you find the timing of that difficult, you can simply just get to the top and then feel how the towel is lagging, which really does give you that feel of the lead arm adducting. For people who want to increase the hand path length, it's exceptional for that. 
people who've got a shorter move probably want to do it a little earlier. But you, if you see there, you could see how much longer the swing got because of it. So if you're trying to increase the, the length of the swing, increase the rotation, let it go all the way back. If like me, you're wanting to get a bit more reduction, feel like once that club and that towel starts to get near the top, change the direction hard. So that should therefore give you more energy going back up through your system. So one of the most misunderstood areas, I think, is the actual environment that you're doing this in. When we have a look at Bryson practicing, he's often practicing really upbeat environments, a lot of music, etc. I've had a junior in with me, you can see it on the screen here, that he's really moving very, very quickly. He started that session at 106.7 miles an hour, finished at 116.3 in a 45 minute session. A big part of this was upbeat music, creating an environment where he was just free to really go after it within the confines of what we were working on for his technique. Two weeks later, we did another speed session of only 30 minutes, and it was 119 miles an hour. So that's an exceptionally big improvement in a really short period of time. Now the environment is that it's upbeat, it's beat, it's fast, it's trying to get you to get the most out of yourself. And that's really what we're after. So if we can create that environment, I think that is vital. Bryson definitely did a lot of that because it's really starting to get, in, get you moving very, very quickly. And it, that energy you create is what is allowing that to happen. Lastly, we've got the gym and the speed stick stack systems etc now i really like the protocols that people have put in place for things like the stack what i would be saying on this they're amazing if you do them all the time if you don't do them all the time they're a waste of, they are a complete waste of time you have to follow it okay over a sustained period and it will then stay in your system if you do it like i see lots of players three months before the season then stop doing it they'll have the speed at the start and by the end they're back to where they've always been you have to make it part of what you do. If you don't, you're wasting your time. Like I say, the stack that Sasho's done is exceptionally good because of the training protocols built into it. The speed sticks are exceptionally good. They're a really good program. You have to do it all the time though. And then lastly, in terms of the gym stuff, go and see somebody who really knows what they're doing. Okay, find out what you're capable of doing. What's the elasticity you've got in your body? Are you needing to do box jumps, lateral bounds? You just need to get stronger. Do you just need to get a bit fitter? I don't know, it's you or the individual. Find someone who knows what they're doing because that way they will then tailor your body for what you're trying to get out of your sport. Uh, and there's loads of people online that do lots of great things, but don't go down the generic angle because we're all individual, unique humans. We need the advice that is unique to us.